volume one chapter one of the day will come this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by celine major the day will come by mary elizabeth braddon chapter one farewell too now at last farewell fair lily the joy bells clashed out upon the clear bright air startling the rooks on the elm trees that showed their leafy tops above the grey gables of the old church the bells broke out with sudden jubilation sudden albeit the village had been on the alert for that very sound all the summer afternoon uncertain as to when the signal for that joy peal might be given the signal had come now given by the telegraph wires to the old postmistress and sent on to the expectant ringers in the church tower the young couple had arrived at wareham station five miles off and four horses were bringing them to their honeymoon home yonder amidst the old woods of cheriton chase cheriton village had been on tiptoe with expectancy ever since four o'clock although common sense ought to have informed the villagers that a bride and bridegroom who were to be married at two o'clock in the westminster abbey were not very likely to appear at cheriton early in the afternoon but the village having made up its mind to a half holiday was glad to begin early a little knot of gipsies from the last race meeting in the neighbourhood had improved the occasion and set up the friendly and familiar image of aunt sally on the green in front of the eagle inn while a rival establishment had started a pictorial shooting gallery with a rubicund giant's face and wide-open mouth grinning at the populace across a barrel of barcelona nuts there are some people who might think cheriton village and cheriton chase too remote from the busy world and its traffic to be subject to strong emotions of any kind yet even in this region of purbeck cut off from the rest of england by a winding river and ostentatiously calling itself an island there were eager interests and warm feelings and many a link with the great world of men and women on the other side of the stream cheriton chase was one of the finest places in the county of dorset it lay south of wareham between corf castle and braxy island and in the midst of scenery which has a peculiar charm of its own a curious blending of level pasture and steep hillside barren heath and fertile water meadow here a dutch landscape grazing cattle and winding stream there a suggestion of some lonely scottish deer walk an endless variety of outline and yonder on the steep hilltop the grim stone walls and mouldering bastions of corf castle standing dark and stern against the blue fair weather sky or boldly confronting the force of the tempest cheriton house was almost as old as corf in the estimation of some of the country people its history went back into the night of ages but while the castle had suffered siege and battery by cromwell's ruthless cannon and had been left to stand as that arch destroyer left it until only the outer walls of the mighty fabric remained with a tower or two and the mullions of one great window standing above the rest the mere skeleton of the gigantic pile cheriton house had been cared for and added to century after century so that it presented now a picturesque blending of old and new in which almost every corridor and every room was a surprise to the stranger never had cheriton been better cared for than by its present owner nor had cheriton village owned a more beneficent lord of the manor and yet lord cheriton was an alien and a stranger to the soil and that kind of person whom rustics mostly are inclined to look down upon a self-made man the present master of cheriton was a man who owed wealth and distinction to his own talents he had been raised to the peerage about fifteen years before this day of clashing joy bells and village rejoicings he had been owner of the cheriton estate for more than twenty years having bought the property on the death of the last squire and at a time of unusual depression he was popularly supposed to have got the estate for an old song but the old song meant something between seventy and eighty thousand pounds and represented the bulk of his wife's fortune he had not been afraid to so swamp his wife's dowry for he was at this time one of the most popular silk gowns at the equity bar he was making four or five thousand a year and he was strong in the belief in his power to rise higher the purchase prompted by ambition and a desire to take his place among the landed gentry had turned out a very lucky one from a financial point of view for a stone quarry that had been unworked for more than a century was speedily developed by the new owner of the soil and became a source of income which enabled him to improve mansion-house and farms without embarrassment 
under mr dalbrook's improving hand the cheriton estate which had been gradually sinking to decay in the occupation of an exhausted race became as perfect as human ingenuity combined with judicious outlay can make any estate the falcon eye of the master was on all things the famous advocate's only idea of a holiday was to work his hardest in the supervision of his dorsetshire property he thought of cheriton many a time in the law courts as fox used to think of st anne's and his turnips amidst the debauchery of a long night's card-playing or in the whirl of a stormy debate purbeck might have been the motto and password of his life he was born at dorchester the son of humble shopkeeping parents and was educated at the quaint old stone grammar school in that good old town all his happiest hours of boyhood had been spent in the isle of purbeck those watery meadows and breezy commons and breakneck hills had been his playground and when he went back to them as a hard-headed overworked man of the world made arrogant from the magnitude of a success which had never known check or retrogression the fountains of his heart were unlocked by the very atmosphere of that fertile land where the salt breath of the sea came tempered by the balmy perfume of the heather the odour of hedgerow flowers rosemary and thyme at cheriton james dalbrook unbent forgot that he was a great man and remembered only that his lot was cast in a pleasant place and that he had the most lovable of wives and the loveliest of daughters his daughter had been born at cheriton had known no other country home and had never considered the first-floor flat in victoria street where her father and mother spent the london season and where her father had his pied-à-terre all the year round in the light of a home his daughter juanita was the eldest of three children born in the old manor house the two younger both sons died in infancy and it seemed to james dalbrook that there was a blight upon his offspring such a blight as that which withered the male children of henry of england and catherine of aragon much had been given to him he had been allowed to make name and fortune he whose sole heritage was a little crockery shop in a second-rate street of dorchester he had enjoyed the lordship of broad acres the honours and position of a rural squire but he was not to be allowed that crowning glory for which strong men yearn he was not to be the first of a long line of barons sheraton of sheraton after the grief and disappointment of those two deaths first of an infant of a few weeks old and afterwards of a lovely child of two years james dalbrook hardened his heart for a little while against the fair young sister who survived them she could not perpetuate that barony which was the crown of his greatness or if by special grace her father's title might be in after days bestowed upon the husband of her choice which in the event of her marrying judiciously and marrying wealth might not be impracticable it would be an alien to his race who would bear the title which he james dalbrook had created he had so longed for a son and behold two had been given to him and upon both the blight had fallen when people praised his daughter's childish loveliness he shook his head despondently thinking that she too would be taken like her brothers before ever the bud became a flower his heart sickened at the thought of this contingency and of his heir at law in the event of his dying childless a first cousin clerk in the auctioneer's office at weymouth a sandy-haired freckled youth without an aspirate with a fixed idea that he was an authority upon dress style and billiards an insupportable young man under any conditions but hateful to murderousness as one's next heir to think of that freckled snob strutting about the estate in years to come blinking with his white eyelashes at those things which had been so dear to the dead his wife to whom he owed the estate had no relations nearer or dearer to her than the freckled auctioneer was to her husband there remained for them both to work out their plans for the disposal of that estate and fortune which was their own to deal with as they pleased already james dalbrook had dim notions of a dalbrook scholarship fund in which future barristers should have their long years of waiting upon fortune made easier to them and for which they should bless the memory of the famous advocate happily those brooding fears were not realized this time the bud was not blighted the flower carried no canker in its heart but opened its petals to the morning of life a strong bright blossom revelling in sun and shower wind and spray juanita grew from babyhood to girlhood with hardly an illness save the regulation childish complaints which touched her as lightly as a butterfly's wing touches the flowers her mother was of spanish extraction the granddaughter of a cadiz merchant who had failed in the wine trade and had left his sons and daughters to carve their own way to fortune 
her father had gone to san francisco at the beginning of the gold fever had been one of the first to understand the safest way to take advantage of the situation and had started a wine-shop and hotel out of which he made a splendid fortune within fifteen years he acquired wealth in good time to send his two daughters to paris for their education and by the time they were grown up he was rich enough to retire from business and was able to dispose of his hotel and wine store for a sum which made a considerable addition to his capital he established himself in a brand new first floor in one of the avenues of the bois de boulogne a rich widower more of an american than a spaniard after his long exile and he launched his two handsome daughters in franco-american society from paris they went to london and were well received in that upper middle class circle in which wealth can generally command a welcome and in which a famous barrister like mr dalbrook ranks as a star of the first magnitude james dalbrook was then at the apogee of his success a large handsome man on the right side of his fortieth birthday he was not by any means the kind of man who would seem a likely suitor for a beautiful girl of three-and-twenty but it happened that his heavenly handsome face and commanding manner his deep strong voice and brilliant conversation possessed just the charm that could subjugate maria morales's fancy his conquest came upon him as a bewildering surprise and nothing could be further from his thoughts than a marriage with the spaniard's daughter and yet within six weeks of their first meeting at a royal academy soiree in the shabby old rooms in trafalgar square mr dalbrook and miss morales were engaged with the full consent of her father who declared himself willing to give his daughter forty thousand pounds strictly settled upon herself for her dowry but who readily doubled that sum when his future son-in-law revealed his desire to become owner of cheriton and to found a family for such a laudable purpose mr morales was willing to make sacrifices more especially as maria's elder sister had offended him by marrying without his consent an offence which was only cancelled by her untimely death soon after her marriage juanita was only three years old when her father was raised to the bench and she was not more than six when he was offered a peerage which he accepted promptly very glad to exchange the name of dalbrook still extant over the old shop window in dorchester though the old shopkeepers were at rest in the cemetery outside the town for the title of baron cheriton as lord cheriton james dalbrook linked himself indissolubly with the lands which his wife's money had bought money made in a frisco wine-shop for the most part happily however few of lord cheriton's friends were aware of that fact morales had traded under an assumed name in the minor city and had only resumed his patronymic on retiring from the bar and the wine vaults it will be seen therefore that juanita could not boast of aristocratic lineage upon either side her beauty and grace her lofty carriage and high-bred air were spontaneous as the beauty of a wild flower upon one of those furzy knolls over which her young feet had bounded in many a girlish race with her dogs or her chosen companion of the hour she looked like the daughter of a duke although one of her grandfathers had sold pots and pans and the other had kept order with a bowie knife and revolver in his belt over the humours of a frisco tavern in the days when the city was still in its rough and tumble infancy fierce as a bull-pup her father who as the years went on worshipped this only child of his never forgot that she lacked that one sovereign advantage of good birth and highly placed kindred and thus it was that from her childhood he had been on the watch for some alliance which should give her these advantages the opportunity had soon offered itself among his dorsetshire neighbours one of the most distinguished was sir godfrey carmichael a man of old family and good estate highly connected on the maternal side and well connected all round and married to the daughter of an irish peer sir godfrey showed himself friendly from the hour of mr dalbrook's advent in the neighbourhood he declared himself delighted to welcome new blood when it came in the person of a man of talent and power lady jane carmichael was equally pleased with james dalbrook's gentle wife the friendship thus begun never knew any interruption till it ended suddenly in a ploughed field between wareham and wimborne where sir godfrey's horse blundered at a fence fell and rolled over his rider ten years after juanita's birth there were two daughters and a son considerably their junior who succeeded his father at the age of fifteen and who had been juanita's playfellow ever since she could run alone the two fathers had talked together of the possibilities of the future while their children were playing tennis on the lawn at cheriton or gathering blackberries on the common sir godfrey was enough a man of the world to rejoice in the idea of his son's marriage with the heiress of cheriton albeit he knew that the little dark-eyed girl with the tall slim figure and graceful movements had no place among the salt of the earth 
his own estate was a poor thing compared with cheriton and the cheriton stone quarries and he knew that dalbrook's professional earnings had accumulated into a very respectable fortune invested in stocks and shares of the soundest quality altogether his son could hardly do better than continue to attach himself to that dark-eyed child as he was attaching himself now in his first year at eton riding his pony over to cheriton every non-hunting day and ministering to her childish caprices in all things the two mothers had talked of the future with more detail and more assurance than the fathers as men of the world had ventured upon lady cheriton was in love with her little girl's boyish admirer his frank handsome face open-hearted manner and undeniable pluck realized her ideal of high-bred youth his mother was the daughter of an earl his grandmother was the niece of a duke he had the right to call an existing duke his cousin these things counted for much in the mind of the storekeeper's daughter her experience at a fashionable parisian convent had taught her to worship rank her experience of english middle society had not eradicated that weakness and then she saw that this fine frank lad was devoted to her daughter with all a boy's ardent feeling for his first sweetheart the years went on and young godfrey carmichael and juanita dalbrook were sweethearts still sweethearts always sweethearts when he was at eton sweethearts when he was at oxford sweethearts in union and sweethearts in absence neither of them ever imagining any other love and now in the westering sunlight of this july evening the bells of cheriton church were ringing a joy peal to celebrate their wedded loves and the little street was gay with floral archways and bright-coloured bunting and mottoes of welcome and greeting and lady cheriton's barouche was bringing the bride and bridegroom to their first honeymoon dinner as fast as four horses could trot along the level road from quiet little wareham by a curious fancy juanita had elected to spend her honeymoon in that one house of which she ought to have been most weary the good old house in which she had been born and where all her days of courtship a ten years courtship had been spent in vain had the fairest scenes of europe been suggested to her she had travelled enough to be indifferent to mountains and lakes glaciers and fjords i have seen just enough to know that there is no place like home she said with her pretty air of authority i won't have a honeymoon at all if i can't have it at cheriton i want to feel what it is like to have you all to myself in my own place godfrey among all the things i love i shall feel like a queen with a slave i shall feel like delilah with samson when you are quite tired of cheriton and subjection you shall take me to the priory and once there you shall be master and i will be slave sweet mastership tyrannous slavery he answered laughing my darling sheraton will suit me better than any other place in the world for my honeymoon for i shall be near my future electors and shall be able to study the political situation in all its bearings upon the isle of purbeck sir godfrey was to stand for his division of the county in the election that was looming in the distance of the late autumn he was very confident of success as a young man might be who came of a time-honoured race and knew himself popular in the district armed with all the newest ideas too full to the brim of the most modern intelligence a brilliant debater at oxford a favourite everywhere his marriage would increase his popularity and strengthen his position with the latent power of that larger wealth which must needs be his in the future the sun was shining in golden glory upon grey stone roofs and grey stone walls clothed with rose and honeysuckle clematis and trumpet ash upon the village forge where there had been no work done since the morning where the fire was out and the men were lounging at door and window in their sunday clothes upon the three or four village shops and the two village inns the humble little house of call opposite the forge with its queer old sign live and let live and the good old george hotel with sprawling dilapidated stables and spacious yard where the mail coach used to stop in the days that were gone there was a floral arch between the little tavern and the forge a floral display along the low rustic front of the butcher's shop and the cottage post office was converted into a bower there were calico mottoes flapping across the road welcome to the bride and bridegroom god bless them both long life and happiness and other fond and hearty phrases of time-honoured familiarity but those clashing bells with their sound of tumultuous gladness a joy that clamoured to the blue skies above and the woods below and out to the very sea yonder in its loud exuberance those and the smiling faces of the villagers were the best of all welcomes there were gentlefolks among the crowd 
a string of pony carts and carriages drawn up on the long slip of waste grass beyond the forge just where the road turned off to cheriton chase and there were two or three horsemen one a young man upon a fine bay cob who had been walking his horse about restlessly for the last hour or so sometimes riding half a mile towards the station in his impatience the carriage came towards the turning point the bride bowing and smiling as she returned the greetings of gentle and simple emotion had paled the delicate olive of her complexion but her large dark eyes were bright with gladness her straw-coloured tussore gown and leghorn hat were the perfection of simplicity and seemed to surround her with an atmosphere of coolness amidst the dust and glare of the road at sight of the young man on the bay cob she put her hand on sir godfrey's arm and said something to him on which he told the coachman to stop they had driven slowly through the village and the horses pulled up readily at the turn of the road only to think of your coming so far to greet us theodore said juanita leaning out of the carriage to shake hands with the owner of the cob i wanted to be among the first to welcome you that was all he answered quietly i had half a mind to ride to the station and be ready to hand you into your carriage but i thought sir godfrey might think me a nuisance no fear of that my dear dalbrook said the bridegroom i should have been very glad to see you did you ride all the way from dorchester yes i came over early in the morning breakfasted with a friend rested the cob all day and now he is ready to carry me home again what devotion said juanita laughingly yet with a shade of embarrassment what good exercise for peter you mean keeps him in condition against the cubbing begins god bless you juanita i can't do better than echo the invocation above our heads god bless the bride and bridegroom he shook hands with them both for the second time a faint glow of crimson swept over his frank fair face as he clasped those hands his honest grey eyes looked at his cousin for a moment with grave tenderness in which there was a shadow of a lifelong regret he had loved and wooed her and resigned her to her more favoured lover and he was honest in his desire for her happiness his own gladness his own life seemed to him of small account when weighed against her well-being you must come and dine with us before we leave cheriton dalbrook said sir godfrey you are very good i am off to heidelberg for a holiday as soon as i can wind up my office work i will offer myself to you later on if i may when you are settled at the priory come when you like good-bye the carriage turned the corner the crowd burst into a cheer one two three and then another one and then three more cheers louder than the first three and the horses were on the verge of bolting for the rest of the way to cheriton theodore dalbrook rode slowly away from the village festivities rode away from the clang of the joy bells and the sound of rustic triple bob majors it would be night before he reached dorchester but there was a moon and he knew every yard of high road every grassy ride across the wide barren heath between cheriton and the old roman city he knew the road and he knew his horse which was as good of its kind as there was to be found in the county of dorset he was not a rich man and he had to work hard for his living but he was the son of a well-to-do father and he never stinted the price of the horse that carried him and which was something more to theodore dalbrook than most men's horses are to them it was his own familiar friend companion and solace a man might have understood as much only to see him lean over the cob's neck and pat him as he did to-night riding slowly up the hill that leads from cheriton to the wild ridge of heath above Franksy island theodore dalbrook junior partner in the firm of dalbrook and son cornhill dorchester was a more distant relative of juanita's than the sandy first cousin in the auctioneer's office whom lord cheriton had once hated as the only alternative to a charitable endowment the sandy youth was the only son of lord cheriton's elder brother long since dead theodore was the grandson of a certain matthew dalbrook a second cousin of lord cheriton's and once upon a time the wealthiest and most important member of the dalbrook family the humble-minded couple in the crockery shop had looked up to matthew dalbrook a solicitor with a handsome old house in cornhill a smart gig a stud of three fine horses and half the county people for his clients to the plain folks behind the counter who dined at one and supped on cold meat and pickles and dutch cheese at nine of the clock mr dalbrook the lawyer was a great man they were moved by his condescension when he dropped in to the five o'clock tea and talked over old family reminiscences the farmhouse on the weymouth road which was the cradle of their race and where they had all known good days while the old people were alive and while the homestead was a family rendezvous 
that he should deign to take tea and watercresses in the little parlour behind the shop he who had a drawing-room almost as big as a church and a man-servant in plain clothes to wait upon him at his six o'clock dinner was a touching act of humility in their eyes when their younger boy brought home prizes and certificates of all kinds from the grammar school it was from matthew they sought advice modestly and with the apprehension of being deemed over-ambitious i'm afraid he's too much of a scholar for the business said the mother shyly looking fondly at her tall overgrown son pallid with rapid growth and overmuch greek and latin of course he is that boy is too good to sell pots and pans you must send him to the university jim jim the father looked despondently at james the son the university meant something awful in the crockery merchant's mind a vast expenditure of money dreadful hazards to religion and morals friendships with dukes and marquises whose influence would alienate the boy from his parents and render him scornful of the snug back parlour with his grandfather's portrait over the mantelpiece painted in oils by a gifted townsman who had once had a picture very nearly hung in the royal academy i couldn't afford to send him to college he said oh but you must afford it i must help you if you and sarah haven't got enough in an old stocking anywhere as i dare say you have my boys are at the university and they didn't do half as well at the grammar school as your boy has done he must go to cambridge he must be entered at trinity hall and if he works hard and keeps steady he needn't cost you a fortune you would work eh james wouldn't i just that's all james replied with emphasis his heart had sickened at the prospect of the crockery business the consignments of pots and pans the returned empties invoices quarterly accounts matchings rivetings dust straw dirt and degradation he could not see the nobility of labour in that dusty shop below the level of the pavement amid ewers and basins teacups and beer jugs cherries and ports but to work in the university hard by that great college where bacon had worked and newton and a host of the mighty dead and where wherewell a self-made man was still head to work among the sons of gentlemen and with a view to the profession of a gentleman that would be labour for which to live for which to die if need be if if mother and me were to strain a pint mused the crockery man who was better able to afford the university for his son than many a gentleman of dorset whose boys had to be sent there willy-nilly if mother and me that have worked so hard for our money was willing to spend a goodish bit of it upon sending him to college what are we to do with him after we've made a fine gentleman of him that's where it is you see matt you are not going to make a fine gentleman of him god forbid if he does well at cambridge you can make a lawyer of him trinity hall is the nursery of lawyers you can article him to me and look you here jim if i don't have to help you pay for his education i'll give him his articles there now what do you say to that the offer was pronounced a generous one and worthy of a blood relation but james dalbrook never took advantage of his kinsman's kindness his university career was as successful as his progress at the quaint stone grammar school and his college friends who were neither dukes nor marquises but fairly sensible young men all advised him to apply himself to the higher branch of the law so james dalbrook of trinity hall ate his dinners at the temple during his last year of undergraduate life came out seventh wrangler was called to the bar and in due course wore crimson velvet and ermine and became lord cheriton a man whose greatness in some wise overshadowed the small provincial dignity of the house of matthew dalbrook erstwhile head of the family the dalbrooks of dorchester had gone upon their way quietly thriving respected but in no wise distinguished matthew jr had succeeded his father matthew senior and the firm in cornhill had been dalbrook and son for more than thirty years and now theodore the eldest of a family of five was son and his grandfather the founder of the firm was sleeping the sleep of the just in the cemetery outside dorchester lord cheriton was too wise a man to forget old obligations or to avoid his kindred there was nothing to be ashamed of in his connection with a thoroughly reputable firm like dalbrook and son they might be provincial but their name was a synonym for honour and honesty they had taken as firm root in the land as the county families whose title deeds and leases wills and codicils they kept they were well-bred well-educated god-fearing people with no struggling ambitions no morbid craving to get upon a higher social level than the status to which their professional position and their means entitled them they rode and drove good horses kept good servants lived in a good house 
visited among the county people with moderation but they made no pretensions to being smart they offered no sacrifices of fortune or self-respect to the modern moloch fashion there was a younger son called harrington destined for the church and with advanced views upon church architecture and music and there were two unmarried daughters janet and sophia also with advanced views upon the woman's rights question and with a sovereign contempt for the standard young lady theodore's lines were marked out for him with inevitable precision he had been taken into partnership the day he was out of his articles and at seven-and-twenty he was his father's right hand and represented all that was modern and popular in the firm he was as steady as a rock had an intellect of singular acuteness a ready wit and very pleasing manners he had above all things the inestimable gift of an equable and happy temper he had been everybody's favourite from the nursery upwards popular at school popular at the university popular in the local club popular in the hunting field and it was the prevailing opinion of dorchester that he ought to marry an heiress and make a great position for the house of dalbrook some people had gone so far as to say that he ought to marry lord cheriton's daughter he had been made free of the great house at cheriton from the time he was old enough to visit anywhere his family had been bidden to all notable festivities had been duly called upon at not too long intervals by lady cheriton he had ridden by juanita's side in many a run with the south dorset foxhounds and had waited about with her outside many a covert they had picnicked and made gypsy tea at corfe castle they had rambled in the woods near studland they had sailed to Branksea and further away to lulworth cove and the romantic caves of stair but this had been all in frank cousinly friendship theodore had seen only too soon that there was no room for him in his kinswoman's heart he began by admiring her as the loveliest girl he had ever seen he had ended by adoring her and he adored her still but with a loyal regard which accepted her position as another man's wife and he would have died sooner than dishonour her by one unholy thought it was nearly ten o'clock when he rode slowly along the avenue that led into dorchester the moon was shining between the overarching boughs of the sycamores the road with that high overarching roof had a solemn look in the moonlit stillness the roman amphitheatre yonder with its grassy banks rising tier above tier shone white in the moonbeams the old town seemed half asleep the house in cornhill had a very philistine look as compared with that fine old mansion of cheriton which was present to his mind in very vivid colours to-night those two wandering about the old italian garden hand in hand wedded lovers with the lamp-lit rooms open to the soft summer night and the long terrace and stone balustrade and moss-grown statues of nymph and goddess silvered by the moonbeams the cornhill house was a good old house notwithstanding a panelled house of the georgian era with a wide entrance hall and a well staircase with carved oak balusters and a baluster rail a foot broad the furniture had been very little changed since the days of theodore's great-grandfather for the late mrs dalbrook had cherished no yearnings for modern art in the furniture line her gentle spirit had looked up to her husband as a leader of men and had reverenced chairs and tables bureaus and wardrobes that had belonged to his grandfather as if they were made sacred by that association and thus the good old house and the good old town had a savour of bygone generations an old family air which the parvenu would buy for much gold if he could true that the dining-room chairs were over ponderous and the dining-room pictures belonged to the obscure school of religious art in which you can only catch your saint or your martyr at one particular angle yet the chairs were of a fine antique form and bore the crest of the dalbrooks on their shabby leather backs and the pictures had a respectable brownness which might mean holbein or rembrandt the drawing-room was large and bright with four narrow deeply recessed windows commanding the broad street and the antelope hotel over the way and deep window-seats crammed with flowers here the oak panelling had been painted pale pink and the mouldings picked out in a deeper tint by successive generation of vandals but the effect was cheerful and the pink walls made a good background for the chippendale secretaries and cabinets filled with willow pattern worcester or crown derby the window curtains were dark brown cloth with a border of berlin wool lilies and roses a border which would have set the teeth of an aesthete on edge but which blended with the general brightness of the room old mrs matthew dalbrook the grandmother and her three spinster daughters had toiled over those cross-stitch borders and theodore's mother would have deemed it sacrilege to have put aside this labour of a vanished life 
harrington dalbrook and his two sisters were in the drawing-room each apparently absorbed in an instructive book and yet all three had been talking for the greater part of the evening it was a characteristic of their highly intellectual lives to nurse a volume of herbert spencer or a treatise upon the deeper mysteries of buddha while they discussed the conduct or morals of their neighbours or their gowns and bonnets i thought you were never coming home theo said janet you don't mean to say you waited to see the bride and bridegroom that is exactly what i do mean to say i had to get old sandown's lease executed and when i had finished my business i waited about to see them arrive do you think you could get me anything in the way of supper janey father went to bed ever so long ago replied janet it's dreadfully late but i don't suppose the cook has gone to bed and perhaps she could condescend to cut me a sandwich or two answered theodore ringing the bell his sisters were orderly young women who objected to eating and drinking out of regulation hours janet looked round the room discontentedly thinking that her brother would make crumbs young men she had observed are almost miracle workers in the way of crumbs they can get more superfluous crumbs out of any given piece of bread than the entire piece would appear to contain looked at by the casual eye i have found a passage in spencer which most fully bears out my view theodore said sophia severely referring to an argument she had had with her brother the day before yesterday how did she look asked janet openly frivolous for the nonce lovelier than i ever saw her look in her life answered theodore at least i thought so he wondered as he said these words whether it had been his own despair at the thought of having irrevocably lost her which invested her familiar beauty with a new and mystic power yes she looked exquisitely lovely and completely happy an ideal bride if her nose were a thought longer her face would be almost perfect said janet how was she dressed i could no more tell you than i could say how many petals there are in that dijon rose yonder she gave me an impression of cool soft colour i think there was yellow in her hat pale yellow like a primrose men are such dolts about women's dress retorted janet impatiently and yet they pretend to have taste and judgment and to criticise everything we wear i think you may rely upon us for knowing what we don't like said theodore he seated himself in his father's easy-chair a roomy old chair with projecting sides that almost hid him from the other occupants of the room he was weary and sad and their chatter irritated his overstrung nerves he would have gone straight to his own room on arriving but that would have set them wondering and he did not want to be wondered about he wanted to keep his secret or as much of it as he could no doubt those three knew that he had been fond of her very fond that he would have sacrificed half his lifetime to win her for the other half but they did not know how fond they did not know that he would fain have melted down all the sands of time into one grain of gold one golden day in which to hold her to his heart and know she loved him End of chapter one volume one chapter two of the day will come by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two and warm and light i felt her clasping hand when twined in mine she followed where i went there is a touch of childishness in all honeymoon couples a something which suggests the babes in the wood left to play together by the arch deceiver fate wandering hand in hand in the morning sunshine gathering flowers pleased with the mossy banks and leafy glades like those children of the old familiar story before ever hunger or cold or fear came upon them before the shadow of night and death stole darkly on their path even godfrey carmichael a sensible highly educated young man whose pride it was to march in the van of progress and enlightenment even he had that touch of childishness which is adorable in a lover and which lasts oh so short a time transient as the bloom on the peach the down on the butterfly's wing the morning dew on a rose he had loved her all his life as it seemed to him they had been companions friends lovers for longer than either could remember so gradual had been the growth of love yet the privilege of belonging to each other was not the less sweet because of this old familiarity are we really married really husband and wife godfrey asked juanita nestling to his side as they stood together in the wide veranda where they were breakfasted on these july mornings among climbing roses and clematis husband and wife 
such prosaic words i heard you speak of me to the vicar yesterday as my wife it gave me quite a shock were you sorry to think it was true sorry no but wife the word has such a matter-of-fact sound it means a person who writes cheques for the house accounts revises the bill of fare and takes all the blame when the servants do wrong shall i call you my idol then my goddess the enchantress whose magic wand wafts gladness and sunshine over my existence no call me wife it is a good word after all godfrey a good serviceable word a word that will stand wear and tear it means for ever they breakfasted tete-a-tete -tete in their bower of roses they wandered about the chase or sat in the garden all day long they led an idle desultory life like little children and wondered that evening came so soon and stayed up late into the summer night steeping themselves in the starshine and silence which seemed new to them in their mutual delight there was a lovely view from that broad terrace with its italian balustrade and statues its triple flight of marble steps descending to an italian garden which had been laid out in the augustan age of pope and addison when the distinctive feature of a great man's garden was stateliness here was the lover's favourite loitering-place when the night grew late juanita looking like juliet in her loose white silk tea-gown with its venetian amplitude of sleeve and its medieval gold embroidery the fashionable dressmaker who made that gown had known how to adapt her art to miss dalbrook's beauty the long straight folds accentuated every line of the finely moulded figure fuller than the average girlish figure suggestive of juno rather than psyche she was two inches taller than the average girl and looked almost as tall as her lover as she stood beside him in the moonlight gazing dreamily at the landscape this hushed and solemn hour on the verge of midnight was their favourite time then only were they really alone secure in the knowledge that all the household was sleeping and that they had their world verily to themselves and might be as foolish as they liked once at sight of a shooting star juanita flung herself upon her lover's breast and sobbed aloud it was some minutes before he could soothe her my love my love what does it mean he asked perplexed by her agitation i saw the star and i prayed that we might never be parted and then it flashed upon me that we might and i could not bear the thought she sobbed clinging to him like a frightened child my dear one what should part us except death ah godfrey death is everywhere how could a good god make his creatures so fond of each other and yet part them so cruelly as he does sometimes only to unite them again in another world nita i feel as if our two lives must go on in an endless chain circling among those stars yonder which could not have been made to be for ever unpeopled there are happy lovers there at this instant i am convinced lovers who had lived before us here and have been translated to a higher life yonder lovers who have felt the pangs of parting the ecstasy of reunion he glanced vaguely towards that starry heaven while he fondly smoothed the dark hair upon juanita's brow it was not easy to win her back to cheerfulness that vision of possible grief had too completely possessed her godfrey was fain to be serious finding her spirits so shaken so they talked together gravely of that unknown hereafter which philosophy or religion may map out with mathematical distinctness but which remains to the individual soul for ever mysterious and awful her husband found it wiser to talk of solemn things finding her so sad and she took comfort from that serious conversation let us lead good lives dear and hope for the best in other worlds he said there is sound sense in the buddhist theory that we are the makers of our own spiritual destiny and that a man may be in advance of his fellow-men even in getting to heaven those grave thoughts had little place in juanita's mind next day which was the first day the lovers devoted to practical things they started directly after breakfast for a tete-a-tete -tete drive to millbrook priory where certain alterations and improvements were contemplated in the rooms which were to be juanita's godfrey's widowed mother lady jane carmichael had transferred herself and her belongings to a villa at swanage where she was devoting herself to the creation of a garden which was on a small scale to repeat the beauties of her flat old-fashioned flower garden at the priory it irked her somewhat to think how long the hedges of yew and holly would take to grow but there was a certain pleasure in creation she was a mild loving creature with an aristocratic profile silvery-gray hair and a small fragile figure a woman who looked a patrician to her finger-tips and whom everybody imposed upon her blue blood had not endowed her with the power to rule 
she adored her son was very fond of juanita and resigned her place in her old home without a sigh the priory was a great deal too big for me she told her particular friends i used to feel very dreary there when godfrey was at oxford and afterwards for of course he was often away it was only in the shooting season that the house looked cheerful i hope they will soon have a family and then that will enliven the place a little millbrook village and millbrook priory lay twelve miles nearer dorchester than cheriton chase juanita enjoyed the long drive in the fresh morning air through a region of marsh and watery meadow where the cattle gave charm and variety to a landscape which would have been barren and monotonous without them a place of winding streams on which the summer sunlight was shining the priory was by no means so fine a place as cheriton but it was old and not without interest and lady jane was justified in the assertion that it was too large for her it would be too small perhaps for sir godfrey and his wife in the days to come when in the natural course of events james dalbrook would be at rest after his life labour and cheriton would belong to juanita no doubt they will like cheriton better than the priory when we are all dead and gone said lady jane with her plaintive air i only hope they will have a family big houses are so dismal without little people the idea of a family was almost a craze with lady jane carmichael she had idolized her only son had been miserable at every parting and it had seemed a hard thing to her that there was not more of him as she had herself expressed it godfrey has been the dearest boy i only wish i had six of him she would say piteously and now her mind projected itself into the future and she pictured a bevy of grandchildren numerous as a covey of partridges in the upland fields of the home farm at cheriton and fancied herself lavishing her hoarded treasures of love upon them she had grandchildren already and to spare the offspring of her two daughters but these did not bear the honoured name of carmichael and though they were very dear to her maternal heart they were not what godfrey's children would be to her she would be gone she told herself before they would be old enough to forsake her she would be gone before those young birds grew too strong upon the wing a blessed spell of golden years lay before her nursery and then a schoolroom and then perhaps before the last dim closing scene a bridal a granddaughter clinging to her in the sweet sadness of leave-taking a fair young face crowned with orange flowers pressed against her own in the bride's happy kiss and then she would say nunc dimitis and feel that her cup of gladness had been filled to the brim the lover's talk was all of that shadowy future as the pair of greys bowled gaily along the level road the horses were godfrey's favourite pair and belonged to a team of chestnuts and greys which had won him some distinction last season in hyde park when the coaches met at the corner by the magazine and when the handsome miss dalbrook lord cheriton's heiress was the cynosure of many eyes the thoughts of sir godfrey and his wife were far from hyde park and the four-in-hand club this morning their minds were filled with simple rural anticipations and had almost a patriarchal turn as of an arcadian pair whose wealth was all in flocks and herds and green pastures like these by which they were driving the priory stood on low ground between wareham and wimborne sheltered from the north by a bold ridge of heath screened on the east by a little wood of oaks and chestnuts spanish chestnuts with graceful drooping branches whose glossy leaves contrasted with the closer foliage of the rugged old oaks the house was built of purbeck stone and its bluish grey was touched with shades of gold and silver green where the lichens and mosses crept over it while one long southern wall was clothed with trumpet ash and magnolia myrtle and rose as with a closely interwoven curtain of greenery from which the small latticed windows flashed back the sunshine nothing at the priory was so stately as its counterpart at cheriton there were marble balustrades and rural gods there on the terrace here there was only a broad gravel walk along the southern front with a little old shabby stone temple at each end at cheriton three flights of marble steps led from the terrace to the italian garden and then again three more flights led to a garden on a lower level and so by studied gradations to the bottom of the slope on which the mansion was built here house and garden were on the same level and those gardens which lady jane had so cherished were distinguished only by an elegant simplicity between the garden and a park of less than fifty acres there was only a sunk fence and the sole glory of that modest domain lay in a herd of choice channel island cows which had been lady jane's pride she had resigned them to juanita without a sigh although each particular beast had been to her as a friend my dear what could i do with cows in a villa 
she said when juanita suggested that she should at least keep her favourites beauty and maydew and coquette of course as you say i could rent a couple of paddocks but i should not like to see the herd divided besides you will want them all by and by when you have a family nita stepped lightly across the threshold of her future home the old grey porch was embedded in roses and trailing passion flowers everything had a shabby old-world look compared with sheraton here there had been no improvement for over a century all things had been quiescent as in the palace of the sleeping beauty what a dear old house it is godfrey and how everything in it speaks to me of your ancestors your own ancestors not other people's that makes all the difference at cheriton i feel always as if i were surrounded by malevolent ghosts i can't see them but i know they are there those poor strangways how they must hate me if there are any living strangways knocking about the world houseless or at any rate landless i don't suppose they feel over kindly disposed to you said godfrey but the ghosts have done with human habitations it can matter very little to them who lives in the rooms where they were once happy or miserable as the case may be has your father ever heard anything of the old family never he says there are no strangways left on this hemisphere there may be a remnant of the race in australia he says for he heard of a cousin of reginald strangways who went out to brisbane years ago to work with a sheep farmer on the darling downs there is no one else of the old race and the old name that he can tell me about i take a morbid interest in the subject you know if i were to meet a very evil-looking tramp in the woods and he were to threaten me i should suspect him of being a strangway they all must hate us with a very unreasonable hatred then nita for it was no fault of your father's that the family went to the bad i have heard my father talk of the strangways many a time over his wine they had been a reckless improvident race for ever so many generations men who lived only for the pleasure of the hour whose motto was carpe diem in the worst sense of the word there was a strangway who was the fashion for a short time during the regency wore a hat of his own invention and got himself entangled with a popular actress who sued him for breach of promise he dipped the property there was a racing strangway who kept a stable at newmarket and married well never mind how he dipped the property there was georgina strangway an heiress and a famous beauty in the sailor king's reign two of the royal dukes wanted to marry her but she ran away with a bandmaster in the blues she used to ride in hyde park at nine o'clock every morning in a green cloth spencer trimmed with sable at a time when very few women rode in london she saw the bandmaster fell over head and ears in love with him and bolted they were married at gretna he spent as much of her fortune as he could get at and was reported to have thrashed her before they parted she set up a boarding-house at ostend gambled drank cheap brandy and died at five and forty what a dreadful ghost she would be to meet said nina with a shudder from first to last they have been a bad lot concluded sir godfrey and the isle of purbeck was a prodigious gainer when your father became master of cheriton chase and baron cheriton of cheriton that is what they must feel worst of all said nita speaking of the dead and the living as if they were one group of banished shades it must be hard for them to think that a stranger takes his title from the land that was once theirs from the house in which they were born poor ill-behaved things i can't help being sorry for them my fanciful nita they do not deserve your pity they made their own lives love they have only suffered the result of their own karma i only hope they will be better off in their next incarnations and that they won't get that dreadful eighth world which leads nowhere said juanita she made this slight allusion to a creed which she and her lover had discussed seriously many a time in their graver moods they had read mr sinnett's books together and had given themselves up in some wise to the fascinating theories of esoteric buddhism and had been impressed by the curious parallel between that semi-fabulous reformer of the east and the teacher and redeemer in whom they both believed they went about the house together nita admiring everything as if she were seeing those old rooms for the first time the alterations to be made were of the smallest nita would allow scarcely any change whatever was nice enough for lady jane must be good enough for me she said decisively when godfrey proposed improvements which would have changed the character of his mother's morning-room a conservatory and a large bay window opposite the fireplace for instance 
but it is such a shabby old hole compared with your room at cheriton it is a dear old hole sir and i won't have it altered in the smallest detail i adore these deep-set windows and wide window seats and this apple blossom chintz is simply delicious faded sir what of that one can't buy such patterns nowadays for love or money and that old chinese screen must have belonged to a mandarin of the highest rank my only feeling will be that i am a wretch in appropriating dear lady jane's surroundings this room fitted her like a glove she is charmed to surrender it to you love and your forbearance in the matter of improvement will delight her your improvements would have been destruction a conservatory opening out of that window would suggest a city man's drawing-room at tulls hill i have seen such in my childhood when mother used to visit odd people on the surrey side of the river loveliest insolence oh i am obliged to cultivate insolence it is a parvenu's only defensive weapon we new-made people always give ourselves more airs than you who were born in the purple she roamed from room to room expatiating upon everything with a childlike pleasure delighted at the idea of this her new kingdom over which she was to reign with undivided sovereignty cheriton was ever so much grander but at cheriton she had only been the daughter of the house indulged in every fancy yet in some wise in a state of subjection here she was to be sole mistress with godfrey for her obedient slave and now show me your room sir she exclaimed with pretty authority i may wish to make some improvements there you shall work your will with them dearest as you have done with their master he led her to his study and general den a fine old room looking into the stable-yard capacious but gloomy this is dreadful she cried no view and ever so far from me you must have the room next the morning-room so that we can run into each other and talk at any moment that is one of the best bedrooms what of that we can do without superfluous bedrooms but i cannot do without you this room of yours will make a visitor's bedroom if he or she doesn't like it he or she can go away and leave us to ourselves which we shall like ever so much better shan't we she asked caressingly as if life were going to be one long honeymoon of course he assented kissed the red frank lips and assured her that from him bliss meant a perpetual tete-a-tete yes his study should be next her boudoir so that even in his busiest hours he should be able to turn to her for gladness refreshing himself with her smiles after a troublesome interview with his bailiff taking counsel with her about every change in his table sharing her interest in every new book i will give orders about the change at once he said so that everything may be ready for us when you are tired of cheriton they lunched gaily in the garden nina hated eating indoors when the weather was good enough for an al fresco meal they lunched under a spanish chestnut that made a tent of foliage on the lawn in front of the house they lingered over the meal full of talk finding a new world of conversation suggested by their surroundings and then the greys were brought round to the hall door and they started on the return journey it began to rain before they reached cheriton and the afternoon clouded over with a look of premature winter no saunterings on the terrace this evening no midnight meanderings among the cypresses and yews the gleaming statues and dense green walls as if they had been romeo and juliet wedded and happy in the garden at verona for the first time since the beginning of their honeymoon they were obliged to stay indoors it is positively chilly exclaimed juanita as her maid carried off her damp mantle my dearest love i'm afraid you've caught cold said godfrey with apprehension do i ever catch cold godfrey she cried scornfully and indeed her splendid physique seemed to negative the idea she stood before him tall and buoyant with a carnation of health upon cheek and lips her eyes sparkling her head erect well no my juno i believe you are as free from all such weakness as human nature can be but i shall order fires all the same and i implore you to put on a warm gown i will she answered gaily you shall see me in my copper plush thanks love that is a vision to live for shall we have tea in my dressing-room or in yours in mine i think we have taken tea in almost every other room in the house as well as in every corner of the garden it had been one of her girlish caprices to devise new places for their afternoon tea whether it had been as keen a delight to the footman to carry japanese tables and bamboo chairs from pillar to post was open to question 
but juanita loved to colonize as she called it i feel that wherever we establish our teapot we invest the spot with the sanctity of home she said fires were ordered and tea in sir godfrey's dressing-room it was lord dalbrook's dressing-room actually and altogether a sacred chamber it had been one of the best bedrooms in the days of the strangways but his lordship liked space and had chosen this room for his den a fine old room with full-length portraits of the sir joshua period let into the panelling the furniture was of the plainest and very different from the luxurious appointments of the other rooms for these very chairs and tables and yonder substantial mahogany desk had done duty in james dalbrook's chambers in the temple thirty years before so had the heavy-looking clock on the chimney-piece surmounted by a bronze saturn leaning upon his scythe so had the brass candlesticks and the ink-stained red morocco blotter on the desk he had fallen asleep in that capacious armchair many a time in the small hours after struggling with the intricacies of a railway bill or poring over a volume of precedents the thick persian carpet the velvet window curtains panelled walls and fine old fireplace gave a look of subdued splendour to the room in spite of the dark and heavy furniture there was a large vase of roses on the desk where lord cheriton never tolerated a flower and there were more roses on the chimney-piece and some smart bamboo chairs many-coloured like joseph's coat had been brought from nita's morning-room and so with logs blazing on the floriated iron dogs and a scarlet tea-table set out with blue and gold china and a moorish copper kettle swinging over a lamp the room had as gay an aspect as any one could desire juanita had made her toilette by the time the tea-table was ready and came in from her room next door a radiant figure in a gleaming copper-coloured gown flowing loose from throat to foot and with no adornment except a broad collar and cuffs of old venice point her brilliant complexion and southern eyes and ebon hair triumphed over the vivid hue of the gown and it was at her sir godfrey looked as she came beaming towards him and not at the dressmaker's masterpiece how do you like it she asked with childlike pleasure in her fine raiment i ought to have kept it till october but i couldn't resist putting it on just to see what you think of it i hope you won't say it's gaudy my dearest you might be clad in a russet cloud for anything i should know to the contrary a quarter of a century hence when you are beginning to fancy yourself passe we will talk about gowns it will be of some consequence then how you dress it can be none now that is just a man's ignorance godfrey she said shaking her finger at him as she seated herself in one of the bamboo chairs a dazzling figure in the light of the blazing logs which danced about her eyes and hair and copper-coloured gown in a bewildering manner you think me handsome i suppose eminently so and you think i should be just as handsome if i dressed anyhow in a badly fitting tussor for instance made last year and cleaned this year and with a hat of my own trimming eh godfrey every bit as handsome that shows what an ignoramus a university education can leave a man my dearest boy half my good looks depend upon my dressmaker not for worlds would i have you see me a dowdy if only for a quarter of an hour the disillusion might last a lifetime i dress to please you remember sir it was of you i thought when i was choosing my trousseau i want to be lovely in your eyes always 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 you need make no effort to attain your wish you have put so strong a spell upon my eyes that with me at least you are independent of the dressmaker's art again i say you don't know what you are talking about but frankly now do you think this gown too gaudy that coppery background to my murillo madonna no love the colour suits you to perfection she poured out the tea and then sank back in her comfortable chair in a reverie languid after explorations at the priory full of a dreamlike happiness as she basked in the glow of the fire welcome as a novel indulgence at this time of the year there is nothing more delightful than a fire in july she said her eyes wandered about the room idly do you call them handsome she asked presently godfrey looked puzzled was she still harping on the dress question or was she challenging his admiration for those glorious eyes which she had been watching in their rovings for a lazy five minutes i mean the strangways that is their famous beauty the girl in the scanty white satin petticoat with the goat imagine any one walking about a wood with a goat in white satin what queer ideas portrait painters must have had in those days she is very lovely though isn't she 
she is not my ideal i don't admire that narrow cupid's bow mouth the lips pinched up as if they were pronouncing prunes and prism the eyes are large and handsome but too round the complexion is wax dollish no she is not my ideal i should have been miserable if you had admired her there is a face in the hall which i like ever so much better and yet i doubt if it is a good face which is that the face of the girl in that group of john strangway's three children that girl with the tousled hair and bright blue eyes yes she must have been handsome but she looks i hope you won't be shocked but i really can't help saying it that girl looks a devil poor soul her temper did not do much good for her i believe she came to a melancholy end how was that she eloped from a school in switzerland with an officer in a line regiment a love match but she went wrong a few years afterwards left her husband and died in poverty at boulogne i believe another ghost exclaimed juanita dolefully poor lost soul she must walk i can't help feeling sorry for her married to a man who was unkind to her perhaps and whom she discovered unworthy of her love and then years afterwards meeting some one worthier and better whom she loved passionately that is dreadful oh godfrey if i had been married before i saw you and we had met and you had cared for me god knows what kind of woman i should have been perhaps i should have been one of those poor souls who have a history the woman mother and her friends stare at and whisper about in the park why are people so keenly interested in them i wonder why can't they leave them alone it would be charity to do so no one is charitable in london do you think people are more indulgent in the country i suppose not i'm afraid english people keep all their charity for the continent i shall never look at the girl in that group without thinking of her sad story she looks hardly fifteen in the picture poor thing she did not know what was coming they loitered over their tea-table making the most of their happiness the sweetness of their dual life had not begun to pall it was still new and wonderful to be together thus unrestrained by any other presence in the midst of their gay talk juanita's eyes wandered to the bronze time upon the chimney-piece and the familiar figure suggested gloomy ideas oh godfrey look at that grim old man with his scythe mowing down our happy moments so fast that we can hardly taste their sweetness before they speed away to think that our lives are hurrying past us like a rapid river and that we shall be like him pointing distastefully to the type of old age the wrinkled brow and flowing beard before we know that we have lived it is a pity sweet that life should be so short her glance wandered to the dark oak panel above the clock and she started up from her low chair with a faint scream stood on tiptoe before the fireplace snatched half a dozen straggy peacock's feathers from the panel and threw them at her husband's feet look at those she exclaimed pointing to them as they lay there peacock's feathers what have they done that you should use them so oh godfrey don't you know she asked earnestly don't i know what that peacock's feathers bring ill luck it is fatal to take them into a house they are an evil omen and father will pick them up when he is strolling about the lawn and will bring them indoors though i am always scolding him for his obstinate folly and always throwing the horrid things away and this kind of thing has been going on for some years i suppose asked godfrey smiling at her intensity ever since i can remember and have the peacock's feathers brought you misfortune she looked at him gravely for a few moments and then burst into a joyous laugh no 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 she said fate has been over kind to me i have never known sorrow fate has given me you i am the happiest woman in the world for there can't be another you and you are mine it is like owning the kohinoor diamond one knows that one stands alone still at the same time peacock's feathers are unlucky and i will not suffer them in your room she picked up the offending feathers twisted them into a ball and flung them at the back of the deep old chimney behind the smouldering logs and then she produced a chessboard and she and godfrey began a game with the board on their knees and played for an hour by firelight End of chapter two
Volume One, Chapter Three of The Day Will Come by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three A deadly silence step by step increased until it seemed a horrid presence there. That idea of the Strangways had taken hold of the bride's fancy. She went into the hall with Godfrey after dinner, and they looked together at the family group the picture was a bishop's half-length turned lengthwise and the figure showed only the head and shoulders the girl stood between the two boys her left arm round her younger brother's neck he was a lad of eleven or twelve in a neat and jacket and broad white collar the other boy was older than the girl and was dressed in dark green corduroy the heads were masterly but the picture was uninteresting did you ever see three faces with so little fascination among the three asked godfrey the boys look errant cubs the girl has the makings of a handsome woman but the lines of her mouth and chin have firmness enough for forty and yet she could hardly have been over fifteen when that picture was painted she has a lovely throat and lovely shoulders yes the painter has made the most of those and she has fine eyes fine as to colour and shape but as cold as a toledo blade and as dangerous i pity her husband that must be a waste of pity if he had been good to her she would not have run away from him i am not sure of that a woman with that mouth and chin would go her own gait if she trampled upon bleeding hearts i wonder your father keeps these shadows of a vanished race he would not part with them for worlds they are like the peacock feathers that he will bring indoors i sometimes think he has a fancy for unlucky things he says that as we have no ancestors of our own to speak of i suppose we must have ancestors for everybody must have come down from adam somehow naturally or from adam's ancestor the common progenitor of the darwinian thesis don't be horrid father's idea is that as we have no ancestors of our own we may as well keep the strangway portraits the faces are the history of the house father said when mother wanted those dismal old pictures taken down to make way for a collection of modern art so there they are and i can't help thinking that they overlook us they were still standing before the trio of young faces contemplatively are they all dead asked juanita after a pause god knows i believe it is a long time since any of them were heard of jasper blake talks to me about them sometimes he was in service here you know before he became my father's bailiff in fact he only left cheriton after the old squire's death he is fond of talking of the forgotten race and it is from him that most of my information is derived he told me about that unlucky lad pointing to the younger boy he was in the navy distinguished himself out in china and was on the high road to getting a ship when he got broke from drunkenness a flagrant case which all but ended in a tremendous disaster and the burning of a man of war he went into the merchant service did well for a year or two and then the old enemy took hold of him again and he got broke there after that he dropped through disappeared in the great dismal swamp where the men who fail in this world sink out of knowledge and the elder boy what became of him he was in the army a tremendous swell i believe married lord dangerfield's youngest daughter and cut a dash for two or three years and then disappeared from society and took his wife to corsica on the ground of delicate health for anything i know to the contrary they may still be living in that free and easy little island he was fond of sport and liked a rough life i fancy that ajaxio would suit him better than purbeck or pall mall poor things i wonder if they ever long for cheriton if old jasper is to be believed they were passionately fond of the place especially that girl jasper was groom in those days and he taught her to ride she was a regular daredevil according to his account with a temper that no one had ever been able to control but she seems to have behaved pretty well to jasper and he was attached to her her father couldn't manage her anyhow they were too much alike he sent her to a school at lausanne soon after the picture was painted and she never came back to cheriton she ran away with an english officer who was home from india on furlough and was staying at ouchy for his health she represented herself as a full age and contrived to get married at geneva the squire refused ever to see her or her husband she ran away from the husband afterwards as i told you in fact to quote jasper she was an incorrigible bolter poor poor thing it is all too sad sighed juanita let us go into the library and forget them there are no strangways there thank heaven 
she put her arm through godfrey's and led him off unresisting he was in that stage of devotion in which he followed her like a dog the library was one of the best rooms in the house but the least interesting from an archaeologist's point of view it had been built early in the eighteenth century for a ballroom a long narrow room with five tall windows and it had been afterwards known as the music room but james dalbrook had improved it out of its original character by throwing out a large bay with three windows opening on to a semicircular terrace with marble balustrade and steps leading down to the prettiest portion of that italian garden which was the crowning glory of cheriton manor and which it had been lord cheriton's delight to improve the spacious bay gave width and dignity to the room and it was in the space between the bay and the fireplace that people naturally grouped themselves it was too large a room to be warmed by one fire of ordinary dimensions but the fireplace added by james dalbrook was of abnormal width and grandeur while the chimney-piece was rich in coloured marbles and massive sculpture the room was lined with books from floor to ceiling clusters of wax candles were burning on the mantelpiece and two large moderator lamps stood on a massive carved oak table in the centre of the room a table spacious enough to hold all the magazines reviews and periodicals in three languages that were worth reading quarterlies revue des deux mondes runchow figaro world saturday truth and the rest of them as well as guide-books peerages clergy and army lists which made a formidable range in the middle godfrey flung himself into a long low armchair and juanita perched herself lightly beside him on the cushioned arm looking down at him from that point of vantage there was a wood fire here as well as in the hall but the rain was over now the evening had grown warmer and the french windows in the bay stood open to the dull grey night what are you reading now godfrey asked juanita glancing at the cosy double table in a corner by the chimney-piece loaded with books above and below for duty reading jones's book on grattan and the irish parliament for old books plato for new wider horizons he was an insatiable reader and even in those long summer days of honeymoon bliss he had felt the need of books which were a habit of his life is wider horizons a good book it is full of imagination and it carries one away but one has the same feeling as in esoteric buddhism it is a very comforting theory and it ought to be true but by what authority is this gospel preached to us and on what evidence are we to believe wider horizons is about the life to come yes it gives us a very vivid picture of our existence in other planets the author writes as if he had been there and according to this theory you and i are to meet and be happy again in some distant star in many stars climbing from star to star and achieving a higher spirituality a finer essence with every new existence until we attain the everlasting perfection and we who are to die old and worn out here are to be young and bright again there in our next world naturally and then we shall grow old again go through the same slow decay grey hairs fading sight duller hearing yes as we blossom so we must fade the withered husk of the old life holds the seed from which the new flower must spring and with every incarnation the flower is to gain in vigour and beauty and the life period is to lengthen till it touches infinity i must read the book godfrey it may be all a dream but i love even dreams that promise a future in which you and i shall always be together as we are now as we are now she repeated those last four words with infinite tenderness the beautiful head sank down to nestle upon his shoulder and they were silent for some minutes in a dreamy reverie gazing into the fire where the logs had given out their last flame and were slowly fading from red to grey it was a quarter to eleven by the dial led into the marble of the chimney-piece the butler had brought a tray with wine and water at ten o'clock and had taken the final orders before retiring juanita and her husband were alone amid the stillness of the sleeping household the night was close and dull not a leaf stirring and only a few dim stars in the heavy sky as the clock tolled the third quarter with a small silvery chime as if it were a town clock in fairyland juanita started suddenly from her half reclining position and listened intently with her face towards the open window a footstep she exclaimed i heard a footstep on the terrace my dearest i know your hearing is quicker than mine but this time it is your fancy that heard and not your ears i heard nothing and who should be walking on the terrace at such an hour do you suppose 
i don't suppose anything about it but i know there was some one i heard the steps godfrey i heard them as distinctly as i heard you speak just now light footsteps slow very slow and with that cautious treacherous sound which light slow footsteps always have if one hears them in the silence of night you are very positive i know it i heard it she cried running to the window and out into the grey night she ran along the whole length of the terrace and back again her husband following her with slower steps and they found no one heard nothing from one end to the other you see love there was no one there said godfrey i see nothing of the kind only that the some one who was there has vanished very cleverly an eavesdropper might hide easily enough behind any one of those cypresses she said pointing to the obelisk-shaped trees which showed black against the dim grey of the night why should there be any eavesdropper love what secrets have you and i that any prowler should care to watch or listen the only person of the prowling kind to be apprehended would be a burglar and as cheriton has been burglar free all these years i see no reason for fear so unless your mysterious footfall belonged to one of the servants or a servant's follower which is highly improbable at this side of the house i take it that you must have heard a ghost he had his arm around her and was leading her out of the misty night into the warm bright room and his voice had the light sound of laughter but at that word ghost she started and trembled and her voice was very serious as she answered a ghost yes it was just like the footfall of a ghost so slow so soft so mysterious i believe it was a ghost godfrey a strangway ghost some of them must revisit this house End of chapter three volume one chapter four of the day will come by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four who will dare to pluck thee from me and of thine own will full well i feel that thou wouldst not leave me the sunshine of a summer morning streaming in through mullioned windows that looked due south raised juanita's spirits and dispersed her fears it was impossible to feel depressed under such a sky she had been wakeful for a considerable part of the night brooding upon that ghostly footstep which had sent such a sudden chill to her warm young heart but that broad clear light of morning brought common sense i dare say it was only some lovesick housemaid roaming about after all the others had gone to bed in order to have a quiet think about her sweetheart and what he said to her last sunday as they went home from church i know how i used to walk about with no company but my thoughts of you godfrey and how sweet it used to be to go over all your dearest words over and over again and no doubt the heart of a housemaid is worked by just the same machinery that sets mine going and her thoughts would follow the same track that is what we are taught to believe dearest in this enlightened age why should it be a ghost pursued juanita leaning back in her bamboo chair and lazily enjoying the summer morning somewhat languid after a sleepless night they were breakfasting at the western end of the terrace with an awning over their heads and a couple of footmen travelling to and from the house in attendance upon them and keeping respectfully out of earshot between whiles the table was heaped with roses and the waxen chalices of the great magnolia on the lower level showed above the marble balustrade and shed an almost overpowering perfume on the warm air why should a ghost come now she asked harping upon her morbid fancies there has never been a hint of a ghost in all the years that father and mother have lived here why should one come now unless unless what love unless one of the strangways died last night at the very moment when we heard the footfall died in some distant land perhaps and with his last dying thought revisited the place of his birth one has heard of such things one has heard of a great many strange things the human imagination is very inventive ah you are a sceptic i know i don't think i actually believe in ghosts but i am afraid of being forced to believe in them oh godfrey if it were meant for a warning she cried with sudden terror in the large dark eyes what kind of warning a presage of misfortune sickness death i have read so many stories of such warnings my dearest love you have read too much rubbish in that line your mind is full of morbid fancies if the morning were not too warm i should say put on your habit and let us go for a long ride 
i am afraid this sauntering life of ours is too depressing for you depressing to be with you all day oh godfrey you must be tired of me if you can suggest such a thing but my nita when i see you giving yourself up to gloomy speculations about ghosts and omens oh that means nothing when one has a very precious treasure one must needs be full of fears look at misers how nervous they are about their hidden gold and my treasure is more to me than all the gold of ophia infinitely precious she sprang up from her low chair and leaned over the back of his to kiss the broad brow which was lifted up to meet those clinging lips oh my love my love i never knew what fear meant till i knew the fear of parting from you she murmured put on your habit nita we will go for a ride in spite of the sun or what do you say to driving to dorchester and storming your cousins for a lunch i want to talk to mr dalbrook about skinner's bill of dilapidations her mood changed in an instant that would be capital fun she cried i wonder if it is a breach of etiquette to lunch with one's cousins during one's honeymoon a fig for etiquette thomas to an approaching footman order the phaeton for half-past eleven what a happy idea said juanita a long long drive with you and then the fun of seeing how you get on with my strong-minded cousins they pretend to despise everything that other girls care for don't you know and go in for literature science politics everything intellectual in short and i have seen them sit and nurse darwin or buckle for a whole evening while they have talked of gowns and bonnets and other girls flirtations then they are not such roman maidens as they affect to be far from it they will take the pattern of my frock with their eyes before i have been in the room ten minutes just watch them i will if i can take my eyes off you juanita ran away to change her white peignoir for a walking dress and reappeared in half an hour radiant and ready for the drive how do you like my frock she asked posing herself in front of her husband and challenging admiration the frock was old gold indian silk soft and dull made with an exquisite simplicity of long flowing draperies over a kilted petticoat which just showed the neat little tan shoes and a glimpse of tan silk stocking the bodice fitted the tall supple figure like a glove the sleeves were loose and short tied carelessly at the elbow with a broad satin ribbon and the long suede gloves matched the gown to the nicest shade her hat was leghorn broad enough to shade her eyes from the sun high enough to add to her importance and caught up on one side with a bunch of dull yellow barley and a few cornflowers whose vivid hue was repeated in a cluster of the same flowers embroidered on one side of the bodice her large sunshade was of the same silk as her gown and that was also embroidered with cornflowers a stray blossom flung here and there with an accidental air my love you look as if you had stepped out of a fashion book i suppose i am too smart said juanita with an impatient sigh and yet my colouring is very subdued there is only that touch of blue in the cornflowers just the one highlight in the picture that is the only drawback to country life everything really pretty seems too smart for dusty roads and green lanes one must be content to grope one's obscure way in a tailor gown or a cotton frock all the year round now this would be perfection for a wednesday in hyde park wouldn't it my darling it is charming why should you not be prettily dressed under this blue summer sky you can sport your tailor gowns in winter you are not too smart for me nita you are only too lovely bring your dust cloak and you may defy the perils of the road celestine lady carmichael's french swiss maid was in attendance with the dust cloak an ample wrap of creamy silk and lace cloud-like indescribable this muffled the pretty gown from top to toe and anita took her seat in the phaeton and prepared for a longer drive and a longer talk than they had had yesterday she was pleased at the idea of showing off her handsome young husband and her new frock to those advanced young ladies who had affected a kind of superiority on the ground of what she called heavy reading and what they called advanced views janet and sophia had accepted lady cheriton's invitations with inward protest and in their apprehension of being patronized had been somewhat inclined to give themselves airs taking pains to impress upon their cousin that she was as empty-headed as she was beautiful and that they stood upon an intellectual plane for which she had no scaling ladder 
she had put up with such small snubbings in the sweetest way knowing all the time that as the honourable juanita dalbrook of cheriton chase and one of the debutantes whose praises had been sung in all the society papers she inhabited a social plane as far beyond their reach as their intellectual plane might be above hers i don't suppose we shall see theodore said juanita as the bays bowled merrily along the level road the greys were getting a rest after yesterday's work and these were lady cheriton's famous barouche horses to whom the phaeton seemed a toy he must have gone to heidelberg before now added juanita he must be fond of heidelberg to be running off there when it is so jolly at home he was there for a year you know before he went to cambridge and he is always going back there or to the hearts for his holidays i sometimes tell him he is half a german she rather hoped that theodore was in germany by this time and yet she had assured herself in her own mind that there could be no pain to him in their meeting she knew that he had loved her that in one rash hour after a year's absence in america when he had not known or had chosen to forget the state of affairs between her and godfrey he had told her of his love and had asked her to give him hope it was before her engagement but she was not the less frank in confessing her attachment to godfrey i can never care for any one else she said i have loved him all my life all her life yes that was theodore's irreparable loss while he the working man had been grinding out his days in the treadmill round of a country solicitor's office the young patrician had been as free as the butterflies in juanita's rose garden free to woo her all day long free to share her most trifling pleasures and sympathize with her lightest pains what chance had the junior partner in dalbrook and son against sir godfrey carmichael of millbrook priory theodore had managed his life so well after that one bitter rebuff that juanita had a right to suppose that his wound had healed and that the pain of that hour had been forgotten she was sincerely attached to him as a kinsman and respected him more than any other young man of her acquaintance had not lord cheriton that admirable judge of character declared that theodore was one of the cleverest men he knew and regretted that he had not attached himself to the higher branch of the law as the more likely in his case to result in wealth and fame the phaeton drove up to the old hanoverian doorway as st peter's clock chimed the quarter after one the old manservant looked surprised at this brilliant vision of a beautiful girl a fine pair of horses a smart groom and sir godfrey carmichael the tout ensemble was almost bewildering even to a man accustomed to see the various conveyances of neighbouring landowners at his master's door yes my lady both the young ladies are at home said brown and led the way upstairs with unshaken dignity he had lived in that house five-and-thirty years beginning as shoeblack and errand-boy and he was proud to hear his master tell his friends how he had risen from the ranks he had indulged in some mild philanderings with pretty parlour-maids in the days of his youth but had never seriously entangled himself and was a confirmed bachelor and something of a misogynist he was a pattern of honesty and conscientiousness having no wife and family to be maintained upon broken victuals and illuminated with filched candle-ends or stolen oil he had not a single interest outside his master's house hardly so much as a thought and the glory and honour of family were his honour and glory so as he ushered lady carmichael and her husband to the drawing-room he was meditating upon what additions to the luncheon he could suggest to cook which might render that meal worthy of such distinguished guests sophia was seated by one of the windows painting an orchid in a tall venetian vase it was a weakness with these clever girls to think they could do everything they were not content with darwin and the new learning but they painted indifferently in oils and in water-colours played on various instruments sang in three languages and fancied themselves invincible at lawn-tennis the orchid was top-heavy and had been tumbling out of the vase every five minutes in a manner that had been very trying to the artist's temper and irritating to janet who was grappling with a volume of johann muller in the original and losing herself in a labyrinth of words beginning with ver and ending with height they both started up from the occupations of which both were tired and welcomed their visitors with a show of genuine pleasure for although they had been very determined in their resistance to anything like patronage on juanita's part when she was miss dalbrook they were glad that she should be prompt to recognize the claims of kindred now that she was lady carmichael how good of you to come exclaimed janet i didn't think you would remember us at such a time 
did you think i must forget old friends because i am happy said juanita but i mustn't take credit for other people's virtues it was godfrey who proposed driving over to see you i wanted to show you what a nice couple we make said sir godfrey gaily drawing his bride closer to him as they stood side by side tall and straight and glowing with youth and gladness in the middle of the grave old drawing-room you young ladies were not so cousinly as your brother theodore you didn't drive to cheriton to welcome us home if theo had told us what he was going to do we should have been very glad to be there too replied sophy but he rode off in the morning without saying a word to anybody he is in germany by this time i suppose said juanita he is downstairs in the office his portmanteau has been packed for a week i believe explained janet but there is always some fresh business to prevent his starting my father relies upon him more every day dear good theodore he is quite the cleverest man i know said juanita without the slightest idea of disparaging her husband whom she considered perfection i think he must be very much like what my father was at his age people who are in a position to know tell us that he is exactly what his own father was at that age said janet resenting this attempt to trace her brother's gifts to a more distant source i don't see why one need to go further my father would not have been trusted as he had been for the last thirty years if he were a simpleton and galton observes the door opened at this moment and theodore came in he greeted his cousin and his cousin's husband with unaffected friendliness it is against my principles to take luncheon he said laughingly as he gave juanita his hand but this is a red-letter day my father is waiting for us in the dining-room they all went downstairs together theodore leading the way with his cousin talking gaily as they went down the wide oak staircase between sober panelled walls of darkest brown the front part of the ground floor was given up to offices and the dining-room was built out at the back a large bright-looking room with a bay window opening on to a square town garden a garden of about half an acre surrounded with high walls above which showed the tree-tops in one of the leafy walks that skirt the town it was very different to that italian garden at cheriton where the peacocks strutted slowly between long rows of cypresses where the italian statues showed white in every angle of the dense green wall and where the fountain rose and fell with a silvery cadence in the still summer atmosphere here there was only a square lawn just big enough for a tennis court and a broad border of hardy flowers with one especial portion at the end of the garden where sophia experimented in cross fertilization after the manner of darwin seeming forever upon the threshold of valuable discoveries mr dalbrook was a fine-looking man of some unascertained age between fifty and sixty he boasted that he was lord cheriton's junior by a year or two although they had both come to a time of life when a year or two more or less could matter very little he was very fond of juanita and he welcomed her with especial tenderness in her new character as a bride he kissed her and then held her away from him for a minute with a kindly scrutiny lady godfrey surpasses miss dalbrook he said smiling at the girl's radiant face i suppose now you are going to be the leading personage in our part of the county we quiet townspeople will be continually hearing of you and there will not be a local paper without a notice of your doings anyhow i am glad you don't forget old friends he placed her beside him at the large oval table on which the handsomest plate and the oldest china had been set forth with a celerity which testified to brown's devotion mr dalbrook was one of those sensible people who never waste keep or wages upon a bad horse or a bad servant whereby his cook was one of the best in dorchester so the luncheon albeit plain and unpretentious was a meal of which no man need feel ashamed juanita was fond of her uncle as she called this distant cousin of hers to distinguish him from the younger generation and she was pleased to be sitting by him and hearing all the news of the county town and the county people who were his clients and in many cases his friends it may be that his cousinship with lord cheriton had gone as far as his professional acumen to elevate him in the esteem of town and country and that some people who would hardly have invited the provincial solicitor for his own sake sent their cards as a matter of course to the law lord's cousin but there were others who esteemed matthew dalbrook for his own sterling qualities and who even liked him better than the somewhat severe and self-assertive lord cheriton while juanita talked confidentially to her kinsman and while sir godfrey discussed the latest theory about the sun and the probable endurance of our own little planet with janet and sophia theodore sat at the bottom of the table silent and thoughtful 
watching the lovely animated face with its look of radiant happiness and telling himself that the woman he loved was as far away from him sitting there within reach of his touch within the sound of his lowest whisper as if she had been in another world he had borne himself bravely on her wedding day and smiled back her happy smile and clasped her hand with the steady grip of friendship but after that ordeal there had been a sad relapse in his fortitude and he had thought of her ever since as a man thinks of that supreme possession without which life is worthless as the miser thinks of his stolen gold or the ambitious man of his blighted name yes he had loved her with all the strength of his heart and mind and he knew that he could never again love with the same full measure he was too wise a man and too experienced in life to tell himself that for him time could have no healing power that no other woman could ever be dear to him but he told himself that another love like unto this was impossible and that all the future could bring him would be some pale faint copy of this radiant picture i suppose it's only one man in fifty who marries his first love he thought and then he looked at godfrey carmichael and thought that to him over much had been given he was a fine young fellow clever unassuming with a frank good face a man who was liked by men as well as by women but what had he done to be worthy of such a wife as juanita theodore could only answer the question in the words of figaro he had taken the trouble to be born that one thoughtful guest made no difference in the gaiety of the luncheon table matthew dalbrook had plenty to say to his beautiful cousin and juanita had all the experiences of the last season to talk about while once having started upon sir william thompson and the ultimate exhaustion of the sun's heat the sisters were not likely to stop End of chapter four